Okay. Hey. Hi. Hello. Hi, Sarah. I didn't know you wrote that. Oh, no. Yes. thing we will be doing and is making little name things so oh, if you take you a piece of paper and fold it sure. and then I'll let you use that thank you Let's see if I have an extra pen downtown and if you couldn't um, distribute yeah. those, please. So you're just making like a name tag so people can see who you are. If you want to remain anonymous, you may. It just helps me remember people's names.
So I know there was some paper that we were using to make oh. that in bag, so. Oh. Yeah, how are you? That's good to hear.
Okay, so for those who have just arrived, as you can see, um, if you have paper, or if there's still paper going around, make a name tag like that, unless you want to remain anonymous. This helps me remember people's <laughs> names and not just say, hey, you, when I'm calling on someone. So any questions? How's everyone doing today? Okay, good. Uh, let, let's see. So where did we leave off last time? John Smith. John Smith. Okay. And what's the deal with John Smith? He named it New England. Yes, that, that's good. That's good. Uh, anything else? Yes. He's a liar. He's a liar. I don't know if we would put it that one. Maybe he's bender of the truth. Bender of the truth. He exaggerated me. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so if you learn nothing else, you know that John Smith did. Anyone else have any? Not necessarily about John Smith, but anything else? Oh, yeah. Shoemaking became a big industry. Oh, this is good. We covered a lot of ground. Okay. So uh, let us see. So, did you want to talk about the syllabus, or do you want to just keep talking about shoemaker and John Smith, liars in history? It's up to me. Okay. Um, okay. So, I'll tell you about the syllabus. Wait, does everyone have one? Okay, so, so we will be proceeding pretty much through Boston history, kind of chronologically, and you have one, two, three, four, four and a half projects to do. Uh, one project you have is the class blog. There's a class blog, a number of you have already signed up for it, others are waiting for an opportune time. And it's a two-step process to sign up. Those of you who've done it, first you sign up. Then you let me know you've signed up so that I can then add you to the blog. So that's part two, which does require me to. So a number of people said, I've been trying all night to post this and I can't. And it's because you needed to tell me you were actually on the blog. Once you're on, you're on. And you can do whatever you want on the blog. Okay? So that's that. And that's where you'll be posting things so people can share it. Then we have... Uh, first assignment, which is due the 25th of February, is to find a Boston book, movie, TV show, video, video game, song, and explain why this is a Boston thing. So it can be, do you have anything in mind? Any ideas? Um, the, song the, the Charlie so, card? Yeah, yeah. you could do Charlie on the MB on, on the MTA. Yeah, that's certainly one. Henry, do you have any ideas? Goodwill hunting. Goodwill hunting. And then, you know, not just don't just animal say, okay, this poor kid from South Boston, genie boy genius from South Boston, runs into Robin Williams from South Boston and hilarity. And so, you know, don't just narrate the plot, but um, why is that a Boston movie? Yes, Kevin. Um, Mass. Black it's mass. A movie about a from yes, that's true. That is. So I guess we kind of know what the genre is. And it's not just crime mill movies. Um, Next Stop Wonderland, The Bostonians. Um, you know, it uh, runs the gamut since, you know, the first printing press in North America was set up in Cambridge. And in 1720, when Benjamin Franklin ran away from Boston, there were eight printing presses in all of North America. Five of them were here. So Bostonians have been writing for a long time. And there are some pretty big novel, novelists, poets, short story writers from Boston. So don't just be misled by Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. So um, there's plenty to choose from. Okay, Charlie on the MTA, the Kingston Boat. It was um, uh, the, band, Boston. the band Boston, that's right. Aerosmith, they were from Boston. Yeah, yeah so Patriots, Patriots Day, there's another one. Yes. Uh, 
Is that right? See him regularly. Wow, wow. That is a fun fact. And I did not know that. Okay, good. So that's one thing. And then second, Boston Monument. Now this one, we're actually having folks come in from our IT department next week to show us how to do this. We have this Oculus Go camera that you can use. You attach it to your cell phone and you can do these 360 degree pictures of things. And so your assignment is to do, and you'll be working in small groups. I know that um, most people have mixed feelings about group projects and we'll try to, this seems like a, a good group. I don't think there's any dead wood sitting here who's going to drag a group down. But if you are that person, well, keep it quiet till you're in the group and then let them do all the work. No, um, you'll do a Boston monument, pretty, probably on the common or public garden. And you'll do the photographing of it to record this image. But then also you need to find out who was the sculptor? Why is it here? Those kinds of things. So it's kind of a multi-step project. So the first thing you need to do is choose a monument. So walk around, look at things, see what looks interesting. Second is to research it, find out all those questions. Step three, photograph it. Then you have to do the processing of this. And then finally, at the end of April, you'll be presenting whatever the monument is. So that's second. And the next one, also a group enterprise, is an eminent Bostonian. Let me just show you this uh, so you get the idea of what it is I'm looking for in this. Okay, so in the book that you're all reading, um, they did this great thing, finding a dozen or so eminent people. And you actually could just have compiled the whole book from these little personality profiles. These are modeled actually on a Scotch ad from the 1960s and the doers profiles. You're all A, too young to remember this. And B, of course, the Dean has told me not to say anything that might encourage drinking. So, but doers had these profiles of people and it had like fun facts about them and then would end with preferred scotch doers. Well, none of these people is a doers drinker, but you see what we have on this are, this is, who is this? John Winthrop. And who is John Winthrop? Lawyer, governor. so you knew that because it doesn't say he was the first governor. That's good. And tells you when he lived, then something about the family, accomplishments, controversy, and a quote. So you're going to kind of do this, but in order to get something this condensed, you actually need to do a lot of research. I mean, find the quote and all this stuff. And see, there are more Ann Hutchinson. There's actually a statue of her. Cotton Mather, Thomas Cass, Lewis Hayden, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, Mary Anton, Louise Day Hicks, uh, Mel King. Anyway, you've seen the book, so you kind of know who's in it. And what you are going to do is actually research a person who is still alive. And as part of the project, you're gonna to talk to the person find out more about his or her life. Now, this will also be a group project. And does anyone know any eminent Bostonians, by the way? I should ask that before I tell you that I found eminent Bostonians for you to interview and profile. So the first thing you have to do is find out something about the person and what we'll be doing next week well, we're going to go to the, uh, actually the Sawyer Library is coming to us and kind of walk us through how you go about doing research like this. We're also going to have a session with the Boston Public Library. And your thing is to find out as much as you can. I have, um, I was going to give you this as an assignment once we've broken into groups, tell you who the person is, and then you have to tell me something about them before I, so we'll get a sense of, do you want to do, they want to know who my people are? 
Okay. I'm just going to try to tell you something about them or just leave you to guess, let you research them, figure this out. As I think I explained last time, it's been a while since I've actually taught in a classroom, so I kind of am rusty as to how I do this. And I'm trusting you not to go and tell the dean, but and you're keeping track of how many times I say something then say don't tell the dean, right? Okay, so if there's a name that is familiar, let me know. Dusty Rhodes? Okay, let's see. Someone will have fun research. And then we have a power couple. Byron Rushing and his partner, Rita Garcia. Yes. What uh, qualifies like as an eminent Bostonian who's still alive? Like what criteria? What criteria would you use? Well, probably active in the community, has made some sort of donation or contribution to public service. Yes, yes. that is. Yes, exactly. Why well, do you have someone in mind? My grandparents actually. Who are they? Uh, they both work giving tours of both Trinity Church Public Library, the Freedom Trail. Okay, possibility. Okay. Um, Willie Evans. William Evans, Suffolk alum. Okay. Let us see. Vivian Lee. Anyone? Okay, John Drew. Drawing a blank on John Drew. Henry Lee. Okay, I have one more. Larry DeCara. Okay, let me give you an assignment then. Um, everyone is going to just now, well, not necessarily now, how about by Tuesday? Um, come prepared to tell us some basic thing about two of these people. So you can then tell the rest of us, okay? So take down the names and just pick any two and we'll hope that through us, through the process of elimination, everyone will have chosen someone. These people did made contributions in the field of um, business, politics, civic government, uh, community activism, and that's Yes, yeah, so there we could, we could we could have found others, and if you're disappointed with the list, I'll go back to the drawing board and tell these folks they're not quite eminent enough, and we will have to find someone else. Okay, but yeah, we are looking for someone who somehow contributed to shaping Boston, and each of these people has in different ways. Okay, so that's that assignment, the eminent Bostonian, and that also can be done in the form of a video or, um, yeah, I think a video is what I was looking for. And then the next one is the mystery photo. And what I will do next week is bring you a, I'll send uh, probably a set of photos I have of Boston, and your job is to figure out what it is when it is and that kind of thing, okay? So that's what you'll be doing over the course of the semester and really getting to know how the city works and what made the city what it is today. And I also have uh, lectures and cultural events over the course of the semester. There'll be a number of opportunities to do these, like go to a, well, virtually lecture, cultural event. You know, officially, we're not supposed to tell you to go to museums or things. Museums are opening in next week with all kinds of protocols. And I should say that 
Uh, with a Suffolk ID, you get free admission to the Museum of Fine Arts. And so that's something, you know, over the course of the semester you'll be doing and participating in other kinds of cultural events to get to know the city better one way or another. Okay, any questions on this? So that's it. Does that sound like not enough? Too much? Perfect. You like, okay, thank you. Thanks for the validation, Seth. Okay. So, any questions? And let's see where we were. Okay, so John Smith calls it New England because it is right between, let me see if this works, the New Netherlands here and New France here. So this area, essentially, the map is in 1614. And then that's pretty much the last we have to do with John Smith. Then, Here's the thing. Has anyone heard of Puritans? Most people have. Okay. Do you want to know more about Puritans or have you heard enough about? Okay. I see. I'm just going with what you say and not ignoring everyone else. So this, what do you know? What does anyone know about Puritans? Yes. Well, you can be persecuted. Wouldn't being persecuted make you annoyed? Yes, but also that they were just crashly over religious people. Well, that's so one way of putting it. What made them so religious? I don't mean to just grill Seth on this, by the way. Why are these people so, you know, the word Puritan too is a name their enemies made up because, is anyone else gonna start talking? I don't mean to be the only one discussing this. They, the big question, people in this period, that is late 1500s, early 1600s were asking. The fundamental, I don't know what fundamental question we are asking ourselves, and the fact that maybe we're not is a sign of something. Is there a fundamental question you're asking yourself every day? So the fundamental question these people were asking every day is, what must I do to be saved? They lived in a time when life was nasty, brutish, and short. That's what one of the great writers of the period said. And the only thing you had to look forward to was the next life where you would be reunited with God. And what you want to do is achieve salvation. And the problem for the Puritans is there is no way of knowing if you've been saved or not. And they also know that nothing you do can secure your salvation. You know, helping old ladies across the street, uh, doing those kinds of things. Those are good things to do, but God isn't watching and saying, oh, that was nice that Jack helped that little old lady across the street today. I'll put the check mark here. The only thing that can save you is your complete faith in God's overwhelming power. And of course, if you have faith in God's overwhelming power, you are going to do the nice things like helping little old ladies across the street and not doing the things you are told not to do. And they base everything on the Bible. And the Bible is pretty clear about the things you are not supposed to do. What does the Bible say not to do? Murder. Don't murder. That's it. I'm glad you got that one first. Yeah. <laughs> sin. Yeah. Well, what, what, is, what is a sin? Gluttony, uh, loss. Um, there is, 
So. Well, not necessarily on sins, but mixing fabrics, cutting the sides of your head, not cutting the shaving the sides of your head. Having a tattoo. That's a little, that's no, no, I don't think those are in the list of things you're not supposed to do. Yeah. There, there's this, the seven major sins in the Bible. Yes. Isn't it the Ten Federal Commandments? Ten Commandments, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what do the Ten Commandments say about missing, mixing fabrics? I'm not saying the Ten Commandments, and oh. other parts of the Bible. Well, the Ten Commandments are the specific thing we're looking at. The other thing, you're, you're basing it on the Old Testament, and this is a New Testament group because the New Testament central character says what about, this is the big issue, one of the big issues, I didn't know we were gonna get into CCD class right now, but the New Testament uh, looks at a lot of these laws and the central character says what? What? He says never mind. He does not say never mind. It's the gist. No, it's not the gist at all. I think, um, I'm sorry, now I'm starting to preach. But, and we're thinking about this in the Puritan context. It's not never mind. And it's not, don't put, don't get a tattoo or mix fabrics or cut, the, cut your hair. They have these specific ones. And, you know, murder is certainly not something he said never mind about. What's on it? Well, are you talking about the, the Ten Commandments or something? Well, there are the Ten Commandments. And then, as Seth was pointing out, a lot of other things developed in, in, in context of the Ten Commandments, you know, not eating pork, not eating shellfish, and so on. And of course, there are good dietary reasons for not doing those things in this particular climate, but these become laws. And then in the New Testament, it's not never mind, it's Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, so that's what everything else hangs on. Those are the central things. But then, of course, we have these other things about don't do any murder, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness, um, don't covet. That's where envy comes in. You know, you're on the right track with these seven deadly sins. They're quite specific. And then there's, a, well, anyway. Uh, we are getting too much into theology here. Just suffice it to say that you had over the course of the century since the New Testament, a religious denomination developed, which did codify things. And the, the church, the Catholic church has, well, we don't, we don't need to talk about the Reformation. It's important in what happened. Suffice it to say, these folks in England and there were other Puritans thought that the institutions that have been created, like all of those rules about mixing fabrics and cutting your hair and uh, not cutting your hair and putting on a tattoo, all of that isn't really scriptural. What we need to do, instead of having this institution, we want each, in, each individual, in order to be saved, needs to connect him or herself with God. And the theological concept of a sin is actually a separation from the divine. So that's the sin. And uh, their thinking is, of course, that the world is awash in sin. And what we are trying to do is escape it. And how do you escape it? The Catholic tradition at this time was by you know, doing these certain things. This tradition is you need to have complete faith. And the problem is with that particular concept, you're never gonna know if you're saved or not. There are no outward signs of salvation. This is kind of the broad overall thing. And uh, we could go on discussing this, and, but you know, the deans told me to stop inquiring into the state of people's souls and where you are on the road to salvation. But this is the central thing they are worried about, okay? And are there any questions? Okay. So this religious movement says that the various trappings of the church actually are distracting us from what the central point should be. 
our connection with God and the various things that have developed around organized religion, like uh, the way the mass is structured, the singing, the incense, the priestly vestments, the candles, the music, the stained glass, our distractions from what our focus should be. Our real focus should be on the word of God in the scripture. And so what we want in a religious service is someone to read a piece of the text and then to expound on it, to explain it. So a Puritan meeting, uh, okay, we'll back up a bit. This is happening within the Church of England. So, so you know, there was the Catholic Church and in the 1400s, there was a rebellion against the power of the Catholic. What does Catholic mean? Funny hats. Uh, no, that's a good guess. Yeah. Yes. Like super Christian? Excuse me? Like super Christian? No. I mean, well, the word. Like version of Catholicism is like a part of Christianity. It is like a part of Christianity, yes. Well, it is. I mean, it does come, I don't know if it's a Latin word or a Greek word. I'm just getting at what the meaning of the word is. The meaning, oh, yeah. The, doesn't it mean like together or something? You're close. Like, you're, you're getting there. I, I, I feel like I should know it. I went to Catholic. I, I feel like you should know it too, but not as just you, Hannah. Uh, uh, I think it's like one, right? Like, it's you know, one, it's universal. Yeah. Okay, so it is a church for everybody. Okay, that's the meaning of it. I'm not saying that yes, it is. I'm not trying to convert you at this moment, but that is the meaning. And then what happens in the 1400s is there is a schism that is a break in the church because the church had become an institution and too interested in its own power and its own um, expansion than in actually getting you on the path to salvation. So you have this schism going on and in England, long complicated story, where you have essentially the king decides, does anyone know this? I mean, you, you knew a lot about John Smith the other day. Anyone ever, yes? He wasn't that he tried to divorce his wife and the Catholics were like, no, and then he was like, well, I'll start my own church. Yeah, so Henry VIII, who is the king, do you remember who his wife was? He had several. Well, he had several. The one he wants to divorce, the first one he wants to divorce. Uh, Catherine. Catherine something. Um, do you know who Catherine something's parents were? Excuse me? They were king and queen of a country. Uh, well, you're you're getting you're getting warmer. Uh, not Austria. They were the king and queen of Spain. Okay, so so uh, you have the king of England wanting to divorce his wife, who is the daughter of the king of Spain. That's not going to go over well with the king of Spain. And of course, divorce is not allowed in the Catholic Church. And by the way, the king of Spain was really an enemy of this whole Reformation thing. And so was the queen of Spain. And when Henry VIII, and in fact, the Pope said, you're such a good uh, ally of the church. I'm gonna give you a title, his most Catholic majesty, his and her most Catholic majesty, okay? Um, so that's pretty good. And then Henry VIII wants to divorce their daughter. They don't like that at all. The Pope says he can't do that. And then as Seth said, the King said, you know what? You, the Pope no longer run the church here, I do. And the King takes over all of the uh, convents, monasteries, churches in England, and now to be a bishop, you know, bishops in the Anglican church are chosen by the king, not by the pope, okay? By the way, 
Before this, Henry VIII had been pretty much down with the Catholic Church. In fact, the Pope gave him the title of Defender of the Faith, which is still a title the British monarch has. So you have England saying, we're no longer part of the Catholic Church. We've got the Church of England here. Now, within the Church of England, there are English people who are reading books by these other Puritan ministers. Cambridge, which is one of the big colleges in England, which is where you go if you want to be a minister. You have to go to college. Cambridge is turning out uh, people who are thinking about salvation and thinking, well, maybe it's not enough just to say we no longer have the Pope. Maybe we need to change the whole structure of this. We should do away with all of the trappings of the Roman church, the candles, the incense, the priestly vestments, etc. So you have this religious movement going on in England. There's the Church of England. And then within it, there's this group saying, we really want to purify the Church of England. And people who don't want to purify the Church of England, they're fine with the way it's been operating, say, what a bunch of Puritans, okay? And so that's kind of what's going on. Now there's yet another, there are lots of these religious movements going on in Europe. There's another group, this group who goes to Plymouth. They go to Plymouth, well, first they had left England because they're getting arrested because it's not, you know, they don't want to go to the services of the Church of England, which they're, you're required by law to attend. They want to read the Bible and listen to the word of God and not simply go through the rigmarole of the Church of England services, which they think are blasphemy. And so they're thrown into jail. They escape to Holland. And then in 1620, having studied John Smith's map, they venture over to Cape Cod and then to Plymouth and set up shop there. Okay? They wanted to get out of England, get out of the Church of England, and they do. This other group, the Puritans, are staying within the Church of England, but trying to purify it. And then about 1619, 1620, a new Archbishop of Canterbury says, you know, these people are really a pain in the neck. Uh, we're not, we don't really like these Puritans anymore. And so we're not going to let them preach, do other things. And this irritates the Puritans, actually suppressing the Puritans. And among the Puritans, there is an idea that we have to get out of England because England is beyond salvation. England is corrupt. England is going the way of Rome. And in order for our souls to be saved and the souls of our children to be saved, we need to get out of England. So that's what's happening in England in the 1620s, a movement by a group of Puritans. Now, it's not necessarily an easy thing just to get out of England. Let me see, I may have, actually have a better set of slides to show you. Who's this? It is John Winthrop. And John Winthrop is a lawyer, very successful lawyer. Most of the Puritans are middle-class people who have the wherewithal to think about their souls. The pilgrims, the folks who go to Plymouth, tended to be more working class folks. And these groups, the Puritans, it's an intellectual movement because they're reading books. And they like their ministers to be able to expound on scripture, which means the minister needs to be educated. And the minister needs to know Latin and Greek and Hebrew. And the minister also needs to be able to speak at great length, explaining these things. So they like to listen to these sermons. They don't like the candles, the incense, the chanting, the singing. What they like in a worship service 
is to, well, a Sunday, you would go to the meeting house in the morning and there would be a prayer. And the prayer would go on for an hour, an hour and a half. And then there would be the singing of a psalm. All of the other uh, songs that have been developed in the Christian tradition were not scriptural psalms are. And other things that had developed in the Christian tradition, like Christmas, they didn't observe Christmas because nowhere in the Bible does it say on December 25th, Jesus was born. There is the story of Jesus being born, but not then. And a lot of what had developed around Christmas was rooted in pagan traditions and they wanted to get away from that. So Christmas, no. Sunday, yes. The Sabbath day, because in that list of rules that we were talking about earlier, one is keep holy the Sabbath day. Okay, so we'll do that. Doesn't say celebrate Christmas. Doesn't say buy gifts, put up a wreath, do anything like that. So none of that. So Sunday, you go to the meeting house, you have the prayer, you have the psalm, then you go home for dinner, and then you come back and a minister reads a passage from the scripture and then gives a sermon. And the sermon could be an hour, two hours long. And if it's really a good sermon, you're going to take notes and you're gonna go home and reflect on it. And if it's a really good sermon, it's probably gonna be published and people will read it. And in this way, the Puritan ministers, their ideas spread among these different congregations. And in the uh, Eastern part of England, in East Anglia, in East Anglia, Lincolnshire, this area north of London. We'll wait for you, Jack. Sure. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> there is a town called Boston and Boston has a St. Batolph's town. It had been. Uh, a lot of English towns were named for saints and St. Batolph is this particular saint. I can't tell you much more about him, but in Boston, England, there is a big church. It's as big as a cathedral and it was supposed to have a tower. They couldn't really build a tower big enough to accommodate this church. So it's called the Boston Stump. And the minister at um, Boston, England was John Cotton. And Cotton was one of the great Puritan divines. By the way, the Puritans didn't like calling their ministers ministers because that again was something that developed after the Bible. So they would call them divines. And Cotton was a great preacher and people would walk five, 10, 20 miles to hear John Cotton give a sermon. And then he is one of the ministers who runs afoul of the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, are cracking down on these Puritans, including John Cotton. Anyway, John Winthrop, lawyer, thinking about the state of his soul, realizes we need to get out of England. And so in 16, the late 1620s, um, Winthrop, through a group of investors, gets a charter from the king. This is actually the charter. And up here in the corner, you see Charles I, the King of England, who gives a charter to this group, the Massachusetts Bay Company, to, be, to go to the Massachusetts Bay and between the Merrimack River and the Charles River, set up a trading company from three miles north of the Merrimack to three miles south of the Charles, this group will be able to go and trade. And they set it up, Winthrop is a lawyer. He knows how to draw a contract. And this is a contract to create a trading company, the Massachusetts Bay Company. Shareholders invest in it. And then the shareholders will meet every year in a general court of shareholders. And they will choose a governor that is a chief executive officer for the company. And they will choose deputies to run the company and then they will adjourn and let the directors and the governor run the company, which is, you know, go to New England, trade for furs, find gold, other things that we're supposed to find in the new world and send the profits back to England. That's what the charter says they are going to do. Now, there are a couple of things 
that are left out of the charter. Usually a corporate charter says where the annual meeting will take place. And usually the annual meeting is, for example, there is a London company that had been started back in 1606 and the London company had started the Virginia colony. Does anyone know where the London company had its annual meetings? The company that is running the Virginia colony? Yes? Uh, no, not in London, exactly. Because, and this is one of the problems in Virginia is the company had set up this enterprise because they wanted profits. And they keep telling the people in Virginia, when are you gonna find gold? When are you gonna find gold? And ultimately, well, they mismanaged things. In 1624, the Indians kill most of the, well, about a third of the people in the Virginia colony. And then the king says, you know, you've really botched it. So he takes over the Virginia company or the London company and the Virginia colony. So Winthrop leaves out of this charter where the annual meeting will take place. He also knew that in 1624, the king had gone to court against the Virginia company and he had taken away the charter. So in 1630, when Winthrop and the Puritans sail, Winthrop has taken the charter with him. And when Winthrop gets here in September of 1630, they have a meeting of all of the uh, men who have come and Winthrop announces that this is the annual meeting of the shareholders of the Massachusetts Bay Company. This is the general court here. Doesn't matter if you're a shareholder or not, all free men are going to be part of this enterprise. So this is also a change, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Winthrop has this in mind that we are going to create not just a corporate body, but a political structure, a commonwealth in Massachusetts. So this is what's happening with the charter and with the sailing in sometime in June of 1630, about 1200 Puritans gathered to get on ships. Yes. I, I'm, I'm listening, but I didn't, I didn't argue about it. Because like, you know, my, my history is rusty as well because I'm a lot older, but it's interesting to me that they were like witches stuff. Well, we'll talk about witches. Mm -hmm. Yes. We'll get to that. Okay. You know, actually, um, it is James the first of James the sixth of England who does talk about uh, that's when witchcraft becomes a crime at around this time, not necessarily because of the Puritans. And we'll talk more about witchcraft later on. But thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, I didn't want to know why I was doing that. No, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, those wacky witches, those wacky Puritans wearing their funny hats, burning witches. So yeah, um, so 1200 Puritans gather at the docks at Southampton in England. They have 12 ships that are going to take them to Massachusetts. The previous year, a smaller group had gone and set up a little settlement north of um, Quanahasset, as it was then called, Boston Harbor, we would call it now, at what is now Salem or what they called Salem. And they thought this is where everyone else is gonna come. And this group arrives at Salem in the uh, early summer of 1630. And they really don't like the way things have been organized here. And so Winthrop and the others come south to um, Boston Harbor. There were a couple of English folks here, I think, did I talk at all about the native people last time? I can't remember. A little bit because it showed us the pool. All right, yeah, okay. Sometime between 1616 and 1619, a plague hit Eastern Massachusetts and killed most of the native people along the coast, including the Massachusetts, the people who lived here in, Mass in, uh, in and around Boston Harbor. Now there were still a few small bands and others, but the area had been depopulated. There still are Massachusetts people around. So not all of them had died. The 
there also had been a couple of other trading expeditions to this area. There was one that had gone to what then was called Wessagusset, another Native American name, which is now, anyone know where Wessagusset is? It is south here, it is now Weymouth. And they had set up a trading company. And among the people that had failed. And one of the folks from the trading company named William Blackstone, he had come over as the chaplain. He was a Church of England minister, but Blackstone had not really gotten along with the bishops in England. So he had come here to be the uh, chaplain for this expedition. The expedition failed and Blackstone decided to stay. He built a house roughly here on the Shawmut Peninsula. He traded with the Indians. He had his books and he also had a white ox that according to what I have heard, he liked to ride around these, this peninsula. Um, and he liked to ride around naked. And this isn't something he could do back in England. So he was kind of happier. And here on Noddles Island, and here at Winnemisset, uh, there was a trader named Samuel Maverick. And Samuel Maverick had an Indian woman as his consort. He traded with the native people. And he was kind of, you know, kind of happy being here, uh, trading with the Indians. There's a guy named David Thompson who had established a little trading post on Thompson's Island. And then there, as I said, there were still some bands of Indians using the Harbor Islands in the summer, then going up the rivers in the winter to the Blue Hills. And you had a relatively small groups of folks here. And then in the summer of 1630, 1200 Puritans arrive. Now, this is a big group. You're gonna have to feed this group, house this group, and it's too many people to house in one place. Most of them stay here on the Charlestown Peninsula. There already was a house there from one of these previous expeditions. So the, how, the great house becomes the basis for their settlement. Another group goes up the river to Watertown and another group comes down here to Dorchester setting up a meeting house. And in Charlestown, there's a meeting house. They call it Charlestown and some, well, in Charlestown, this is the late summer of 1630, there were a couple of problems. One, there's not a whole lot of fresh water. Two, a lot of mosquitoes. And three, as I said, the native population had pretty much died suddenly in 1616, 1619. So consequently, you no longer have people hunting the deer and the other wildlife which means there is a precipitous increase in the deer population. Can anyone predict any consequences of having a lot of deer? Yes. Hunters? Well, the problem is that's the reason there are more deer because there aren't any hunters because the, um, the Indians are no longer hunting them. But you're on the right track. There is going to be something hunting deer. Well, that's a good guess. What kind of animal might you see making increasing if there are a lot, there's a lot of food for? Yes. Wolves, yes. So there are a lot of wolves. And in fact, the native people had died so quickly that the survivors couldn't bury the dead. And wolves do feed on um, anything they find lying around. So this had led to an increase in a wolf population. So now think about it. You have several hundred of these Puritans in Charlestown. They don't have good water. And has anyone here ever had an encounter with a wolf? <laughs> Coyotes are related to wolves. In fact, they have the same DNA as well. Also the same DNA as dogs. So um, nice coyote. Yeah, okay, so wolves, think about a bigger coyote who's not going to leave, and they howl, they travel in packs. And so this really unnerves these folks from 
England who have arrived in this wilderness. Now, what happens here is a couple of these Puritans, um, Sir Isaac Johnson and his wife, whose name was Arabella, which, and actually he was one of the chief funders of the expedition. And so the flagship of the Winthrop fleet, anyone know what the flagship was? Arabella. The Arabella, thank you. So um, they were old friends of the Reverend Blackstone and they go over to the Shawmut Peninsula. Shawmut means the place of living waters. And they tell Blackstone how miserable they are over in Charlestown. And when they get to the part about now no good water, Shawmut says, oh, well, I'm sorry, Blackstone, who lives next to a spring. And actually the spring is still there. You have to look down a manhole, but you can see it on Beacon Hill and you can hear the water running. Blackstone says, well, why don't you come over here? Because Shawmut is the place of living waters. And they think that sounds like a great idea. They come over and so do several hundred of their friends, which isn't really what Blackstone was expecting. So when you make an invitation like this, remember to be a little more specific about who is invited. And Blackstone decides he doesn't want to have anything more to do with these folks. So he takes off for what now is Rhode Island. But this leaves all of these Puritans here in the Shawmut Peninsula. And in early September of 1630, Governor Winthrop assembles the general court in Newtown because it's about halfway between Charlestown and Watertown. And at this meeting, the various freemen from Charlestown, the Shawmut Peninsula, Dorchester, Watertown, decide that the Shawmut Peninsula will be their Shire town, that is the capital of this settlement because it's centrally located. And also they will call it, what did they decide to call it? The town they will build on the Shawmut Peninsula. Boston, thank you, yes. So this is September of 1630. They found the town of Boston. Into the 1660s, Dorchester was actually a bigger town, um, but Boston becomes the capital. And because of Boston's harbor, it's going to become a prosperous place. So Boston at that time included the Shawmut Peninsula, Noddles Island, Hog Island, Deer Island, and uh, Rumney Marsh, what is now Chelsea and Revere, okay? And then the town of Roxbury founded at about the same time, town of Dorchester and Newtown. Any questions on any of this? Okay, good. Here is the charter. Has anyone seen this monument on the common? Yes, this is the Founders Monument put up in 1630 on the 300th anniversary of the founding of Boston. So nine years from now, we will have the 400th anniversary of the founding of Boston. So you should start thinking about what will be a proper way to mark that occasion. And actually William Blackstone's house was right about here. And it's up this little street that you can hear the um, spring running under the street. Okay. So that's Boston, the founding of Boston in 1630. Okay, now during this time, the, in England, these Puritans had left. Well, actually I didn't give you the most important part of this. I apologize. Think about this. Governor Winthrop is bringing, he's the governor. And governors of a group like this, where, you know, uh, uh, well, it's different from being a king where you can order people around. He really needs to build consensus among these folks. And he also has a really big worry. When they're in England, there's a really a strict social hierarchy. Everyone knows his or her place. What is going to happen when they get to this new world? and there's nothing constraining anyone. What's going to keep 
So everyone from simply saying, I don't wanna be part of this particular settlement, I'm gonna go somewhere else. Or someone who, um, well, I think you can imagine having a society, we talked about the code of laws in the Bible. Does everybody always obey these laws? Not the ones about not mixing fabrics, cutting your hair, or putting on tattoos. But what are the others? The pretty simple ones like do no murder, bearing false witness, committing adultery, coveting your neighbor's wife and your neighbor's ox, and so on. People pretty much obey those things. Which is, I think, one reason why we have laws and here the Puritans are busy preaching, not because people are basically good and always are going to listen, always going to do these things, but to remind them that they have to, they should do these things. So Winthrop has pretty big worries here. They want to be a community of saints, but saints face all kinds of temptations. And what happens when they get to the new world? Will people get along with each other? Or will they try to kill each other? And what will happen? And this is a pretty big worry. Is this thing going to work? And when they gathered at Southampton in the early summer of 1630 to sail, uh, first the Reverend Cotton read a sermon to them, a farewell sermon to these people going to the new world. And then Governor Winthrop, who is a lawyer, reads a sermon. And Winthrop's sermon is probably the most famous, the most well-known Puritan sermon of all time. And it's somewhat ironic because Winthrop isn't a minister, he's a lawyer. And his sermon really is a sermon by a Puritan lawyer. And he begins, as sermons typically do, with a little bit of text. And the text for Governor Winthrop is that God Almighty in his infinite wisdom hath created the world so that at all times, some must be high and eminent in degree, others meek and in subjection. Which he takes as just a matter of course. There are gonna be some people high and eminent in degree, others meek and in subjection. Now in England, everyone knew where they were. In this new world, no one knows where they are. How do you maintain any kind of social order in this new world? And so Winthrop really meticulously creates for them an idea of what is going to hold this community together. First, the image he uses for what this community is, is the same in an image that Christians used to explain the church or the model that, that created the church. And the church in the Christian view of it is modeled on the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And a body, Winthrop explains, has lots of different parts. And some parts are more important than others, but the body can't function without all of them. And what holds this body together for Winthrop was love. And he defines love, the different kinds of love that form the ligaments of this body and hold it together. This is the kind of community he is hoping to create in the new world. And he explains, he goes through this in great detail, thus stands the cause between God and us. We are entered into a covenant with him for this work. We have taken out a commission. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles. We have professed to enterprise these and those accounts upon these and those ends. We have hereupon besought him of favor and blessing. Now, if the Lord shall please to hear us, and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then hath he ratified this covenant and sealed our commission, and will expect a strict performance 
of the articles contained in it. This is very much what a lawyer would say. That is, we've drawn up a contract with God. And if God, we wanted God to take us to this place. And God, if God does, then he's upheld his start side of the contract. What does he expect from us? And what we have, I mean, God didn't have any hand in drawing up the contract. We did. So we got to say, what are the articles? Okay, God, take us to this new place. And this is what we will do. Now, he will expect a strict um, performance of the articles contained in it. But if we shall neglect the observation of these articles, which are the ends we have propounded, and dissembling with our God, shall fall to embrace this present world, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, prosecuting our carnal intentions, the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us, be revenged of such a perjured people, and make us know the price of the breach of such a contract. What's this mean? Does everyone know what dissembling means? If you dissemble, excuse me? Uh, no, good guess. Dissembling with God. It's not quite lying, but it's not quite being truthful. Okay, so dissembling with God. I think, you know, I, I'm not, not saying if you realize it's not a thing you should do, but you should understand that to this way of thinking, yeah, that's a bad thing. Um, dissembling with our God. Falling to embrace this present world. What does that mean? What world should you be embracing? The next one. Thank you, Seth. So instead, we get caught up in this one. Prosecuting our carnal intentions. And what are carnal intentions? Yes? It's just a guess from what I remember from Jesus Christ. But um, you're like gluttony, lust, you're... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Carna, uh, carne means what? Uh, flesh. Flesh, exactly. Yeah, so, okay. So, prosecuting those intentions, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity. What does that mean? We want good for ourselves and our children. Yeah, so this is, I think, one of the things that makes this so difficult for us to understand. If it turns out that we and our children are successful, the implication is not, God's really happy, that's why he's let, made us prosperous. The implication is, this is a sign we have betrayed the covenant. So seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, you cannot know what God's intentions are. Okay, and then the Lord will break out in wrath against us, be revenged of such a perjured people. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah. Micah was an Old Testament prophet, and his counsel was to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our community and commission in the work our community as members of the same body. So shall we keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. 
The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as his own people. So that we shall see, he will command a blessing upon us in all our ways, so that we shall see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than formerly we have been acquainted with. We shall find the God of Israel is among us when 10 of us are able to resist a thousand of our enemies, that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil for the ways of God and of all professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. You know, for much of the time, people have been familiar with this since then. It comes back into, well, it, it's unclear um, what happens to the exact text of this, but the thinking was Winthrop gave this sermon on the Arabella as they're at sea which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because only about a 12th of the people are on the Arabella, the rest are on these other ships. And then there was another that he gave it when they arrived. And that phrase, the city upon a hill, does make us think about the hills on the Shawmut Peninsula. But more recent scholarship suggests he gave this in Southampton before he knew anything at all about the landscape here. And that never really made sense to me because if I heard this about the consequences of failure, I'm pretty sure I would not have got on the boat. What would you have done? Yeah. And the phrase city upon a hill has the implication people are looking with admiration at this, but it seems to be something else. Everyone is watching, waiting for you to screw up waiting for us to screw up, which inevitably we will. And then that is going to be disastrous, not only for us, but for all of our descendants and for the entire world. Any other thoughts on this? Today's sermon, which is called the new model of Christian charity, because he does want the bond to be loved, but he also understands how difficult it is going to be to create this community. So they do arrive. And as we've said, uh, 1200 of them come and set up shop here in the pencil. Okay. I think um, I'm actually just getting warmed up and I think I'll spend the rest of the evening in here preaching and, but you don't need to be part of it. I do have an assignment for you on the blog, which is this. In the book you are reading about a short history of Boston, um, the book begins at an historical site. And what I would like you to do is take a picture of yourself at that site and post it on the blog. Okay, so that's step one for next Tuesday. Okay, sometime between now and then, take a picture of yourself at the site. Don't blurt out what it is, let people find it, Sana. And uh, so I will see you, let me just see who is here. Lily is here, Ahad is not here. Okay. By the way, if for some reason you're not able to come to class, I am putting this on Zoom so that you can stream with us if you're not able to join us. Let's see, Kathleen is here, Hannah is here, Pablo, Pablo here, Seth is here, Ismael Darden, 
Okay, Henry is here. Emma. Yep. Yep. Okay, Donna, Jonathan Garbarino. One place. Logan is here. That's me. That's you. No, you go by Jack. Okay, good. Sorry. That's okay. No, don't be sorry. Uh, Logan, I thought was here. Here. Yeah, there you are. Uh, Amber is here. Okay. Sana. Amelie. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, see how not here. Leo not here. Sonia. What is that, Sonia? Yes, Sonia. there you are. Uh, Gianfranco. Okay. Did I get everyone? Miss anyone? Okay, good. So I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. 